I am very excited to be here with Dave and Captain with, there we go, the calling card right there. Dave, you guys just performed an amazing show here at the Roxy. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned on stage uh, having played here in... We played in 77. 77. The first time, yeah. Okay. Okay. Although we were... Was it the Roxy we were supposed to play with television? <laughs> My brain's gone, yeah. Dave. I'm awfully sorry. <laughs> it's been a long uh, night, you I know. It, it could have been the Roxy. Yeah. I, I, um, I think it might have been. We did, we did play here in 77. I think in 76 we were supposed to play with uh, television. Yeah. But they had um, heard reports of our shows in New York and across uh, the East Coast yeah. and decided that they didn't want us on the bill. So we ended up completely broke wow. out here sleeping on people's floors while the manager scraped around looking for a show for us. And wow. Luckily, the Dickies came to our rescue, and we played some shows with the Dickies. But uh, we did go down to the television show, though, and threw, and threw some abuse at them. Even though, we, even though they were a great band, they don't, obviously didn't like us. There was some justified indignance there, I'd imagine, right, Captain? But, yeah, but, they, you know, they were doing a different thing. But I think they got a lot of... I mean, punk's a broad church, you know, and they were doing a totally different thing, and they didn't have the attitude. Maybe they... I think they were a little bit kind of um, intimidated, yeah. yeah. And we... You know, we're, we're not unpleasant blokes, but, um, uh, well, we were back then, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah. well, we're a bit too wild for them, you know, it just, it was too crazy. Well, it sounds like you, in essence, upstage television, which is no small feat, so uh, that's a good thing to have on your resume, I think. Well, I, I, was, a, I was a big Richard Hell fan, though, yeah. I loved his, I loved his yeah. uh, single that he did, that little Johnny Jewel yeah. single right yeah. back then. That's brilliant stuff. Definitely. You know, and Torn Curtain, I must admit, I loved that. Uh, Definitely beautiful stuff. Well, looking back, this is kind of an epic year for you guys because it's the official 40th anniversary of the band uh, being together. It's the 40th uh, anniversary of New Rose being released. Oh, gotcha. okay. So then the album came after and everybody was in it 40 years the year after. Okay. A lot of rock journalists or punk journalists talk about you guys as the, uh, the band of first. You know, the first sort of British punk band to release a single, um, to release a full-length album, to um, actually tour America, I guess, uh, opening with T-Rex. That was actually historic at the time. It just happened. Yeah. It did happen. You know, I mean, there's no denying the fact that it happened. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean it wasn't a race. You guys weren't like, oh, no, shit, we're six like months before the Sex we Pistols. We got to the first. Yeah. It wasn't like that. It just we were. Yeah. You know, it's as simple as that. We were lucky. I've read some really interesting things about, like, the start, when you guys first got together, uh, the Masters of the Backside, and kind of, kind of some of the origin stories of you guys. And um, could you tell me a little bit about kind of those early years, your memories uh, of that era? Um, Chrissy Hind actually was sort of involved, I guess, for a short period of time with you guys back then. Little known fact. Uh, well, the truth is, I'd never been in a band before. Yeah. And I, I was going to London, look, just, I was trying to be a... a, a Funny enough, I was trying to be an artist, but it didn't happen. I was trying to be a commercial artist, couldn't get in. And I ended up realizing that I could sing in my bedroom like kids do with their record player. And I lied, basically, and said I'm a singer. And uh, Chrissy Hind and uh, a few other people were trying to put a band together. And I ended up in this band with uh, Chrissy Hind as a guitarist and this other singer which had blonde hair. So it was called Dave as well. So there were these two Dave lead singers gotcha. that yeah. kind of traded. Okay. Yin and a yang, sort of, yeah. Huh? A sort of it a yin and a yang kind of yang. thing? Yeah, I mean, he, he was very kind of effeminate and, and a lovely guy, but he was very sort of soft and, you know. And, okay. and um, But we didn't do any shows. We just rehearsed. Yeah. And it came to... We, we did old 60s Nuggets type songs, and then it became apparent that it wasn't really going anywhere. Yeah. So, um, Chrissy was playing guitar, but she really had a lovely, you know, she wasn't singing at that point. And I kept saying, you should sing, you know, rather than, but, and um, then suddenly I was introduced to Brian by Rat, who was on the drums at the mm -hmm. time. And I ended up auditioning for The Damned. But he came into the band after the, there was no bass player in this other band. And uh, Rat brought him down, because they were great friends. And I can remember Malcolm McLaren saying, what do you want this guy for? He's a fucking hippie. Because <laughs> he looked just like Mark Bolan at the time. Gotcha, gotcha, he was okay. a big Bolan fan. Right, yeah. right. And you guys had opened for T-Rex, so there was some I connection. Was, yeah. I was a very big um, glam rock fan, I have, yeah, to, I have yeah. to say. But, but London was a melting pot at the time in 76 of um, people, it, people who wanted a different kind of music that w they weren't getting um, at gigs or on TV or on the radio or anything like that because it was 
kind of there was whispering. Well, there was Bob Harris, and there was a lot of um, there was a lot of country rock around, and it was kind of uh, boring. And 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 the, the prog rock bands were singing songs about you know knights of the round table and uh, pixies and wizards and all this sort of thing, which didn't really talk to um, sort of working class yeah. Brits sort of I, I, it was incomprehensible nonsense and th and then after a, like sort of you know uh, a few of those songs you get a 20 minute drum solo so we weren't really getting the music we wanted to hear and we had to do it for ourselves yeah. so London was a melting pot of like different uh, lots of lots of people and we went we were all trying to form bands yeah. and uh, we all went to each other's shows I mean uh, we would go to a Sex Pistol show and there'd be my, maybe a uh, 25 30 people there yeah. you know but the, all the people in the audience would be people who were forming bands like Mick Jones and um, and, and all the rest the of them of bands wasn't it yeah it's was really yeah. funny well it's interesting because we've interviewed some folks uh, Steve Diggle from the Buzzcocks Lee Gorman from Bow Wow Wow a lot of folks from Britain at that time that talked about that scene and and you described it perfectly the same I think Lee mentioned that there was I don't want to use the word incestuous, but um, a really cohesive community of like-minded individuals that just happen to connect and try out for different bands. And um, you guys were just talking about Malcolm McLaren. I definitely want to kind of ask you a few questions about him, because he obviously was so instrumental in the formation of, of different bands, but he was kind of a uh, sort well, of a unifying yeah. factor. In well, that's, well, that's the way he would tell the story, to be quite honest. Uh, tell us the truth here on Inner Edge well, Music. Yeah. If you read um, certain books, uh, then Malcolm was like sort of tugging the strings of all the, the whole scene, but it was not actually true. I mean, the Buscocks were up in Manchester. Stinky Toys were in Paris. The Saints were in Melbourne. I mean, punk rock was happening everywhere without uh, Malcolm McLaren. And he had nothing to do with us, you know. Okay. In that period, there were a, a, a bunch of slightly older guys. Uh -huh. There was uh, Malcolm McLaren, John Cravine, who mm -hmm. managed The Clash, mm -hmm. and they were all in the rag trade, selling clothes. And they'd been around long enough that they'd seen what happened at the end of the 60s and the Beatles and things like that, yeah. and they realized that, hey, this is there's something happening here, something and they to wanted to get involved. Something to capitalize so, on economically, yeah. perhaps? So, exactly, and uh -huh. so rather than actually uh, pulling the strings, they were just involved, you know, because they were already there, and they'd seen what was happening, and they had the benefit of uh, age, basically, because yeah. they were slightly older than the rest wisdom, of them. Yeah. 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 That's really interesting, guys, because I think you're right that sometimes some of those folks, the Sven Gallis or whatever, are credited to be maybe more of a puppet masters. They get more credit than maybe they deserve, perhaps. Yeah, well, a few years ago, I, I ran into John Cravine, and he said, you don't remember me, do you? I invented punk rock. So, ah, okay. so, you know, kind of lost it a little, I think. Did you kick his teeth in with your boots at that point? Or no, no, I just, I just laughed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what can you do? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a good, interesting point because, again, so much talent, and this band in particular, 40 years, um, nobody but you guys really deserves credit for that. I guess the fans also are part of that. You guys have very loyal fans. Well, I'm, I, I'm not a moaner. I le never let it be said. Uh, yeah. But... Um, <laughs> But the, the, the thing is that if, if it wasn't for the fans, um, this band wouldn't exist because we don't get a vast amount of support from um, TV and radio and, you know, the mag I mean, people like Rolling Stone. I mean, we, we couldn't even get into their top 40 um, punk rock albums. And, uh, you know, we were basically the first in the UK anyway. So, I mean, not that up, that upsets me. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't. Um, but I only, I only mention that because... At that yeah. period in time, 77, 76, we mm -hmm. had every front cover of every paper, every magazine. Wow. We were just everywhere. Yeah. And then to, to deny our place in history is what's wrong. It's not that you want to moan about it. Yeah. It's just like we were there. You well, know? We definitely want to try to set the record straight here. I, I, uh, think, you're, uh, I think it would have been better if we'd uh, like sort of destroyed ourselves or died or something like that. And then... People go, oh, the damned, what a classic band. Oh, I wish I could see them now or something, yeah. you know. But then you guys would be a punk rock cliche. I mean, dying with a needle in your arm. I mean, I think what's so unique about you guys, and I mentioned to Dave earlier, when I was in the audience, a, a woman, a fan, whispered, I mentioned that I was going to be doing an interview with the band. And she said, you know what, Jason? I think this band has no idea how loved and appreciated they are. And uh, basically how, you know, I think in essence kind of referencing uh, how how little credit uh, maybe 
you guys have gotten in some respect, but also just the loyalty and the uniqueness of you guys. And if you had been a cliche, I don't think any of that would have been um, relevant. I've never felt neglected. I mean, like I lost my suitcase a couple of days ago and, and tonight people donated these wonderful buttons, which are... All the bands that said they were doing it for the credibility of whatever they were doing were signing massive record deals and we were signing tiny record deals thinking we were doing the right thing and we weren't doing the right thing. And so we ended up without the success and the the money and the machinery around us to push us forward. Um, Where those other bands had all that. We we signed with like DIY labels like Stiff Records and uh, Chiswick. Chiswick. And we were, uh, we'd all be in like, uh, in the basement, like packing up the, uh, bagging the singles for the next Elvis Costello record or the next uh, Madness record, yeah. you know, everyone had to muck in and uh, and and do it for the cause, you yeah. know. That, but you, you know, it wasn't EMI or the CBS yeah. or anything. Yeah. Well, that might be one reason why too the fans. I mean, the DIY ethos very common in in the punk scene. Um, you know, I mean, I think that's one reason why you guys aren't a cliche. You know, you didn't necessarily sell out. You didn't. Uh, Ha- well, well I, I, I don't know what selling out yeah. was anyway, but yeah. I, I think the, the thing is we were always the outsiders yeah. right from the beginning. We were doing our own thing. And, and, and it, it, it was annoying be- to me because the word punk was coined and it was supposed to mean any, no rules, anything is possible. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly it, it came with a set of rules. It came with a set of you can't do this, you shouldn't listen to that, you shouldn't do this, you should dress this way. At the beginning it wasn't like that. It yeah. was full of incredibly different but diverse bands all with different you know the 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 thing that brought us all together is we were all young and we all wanted to do something and we were excited and it was a great musical movement and it's the same as the 50s the 60s it's happened you know over and over and it was an incredible time but a year or so into into that era it became the press told us what it was suddenly and everyone believed that's what it was and then you got the second wave of punk and it wasn't so good guys one important question that i really have been wanting to ask you guys for a long time is through the years you've collaborated with a lot of wonderful people chrissy hine lemmy um just so many people and looking back on the the four decades the legacy of of the band um are there any sort of standouts in terms of collaboration people that you toured with fond memories of of working well, that's, with folks that's difficult because obviously there there's been amazing things i mean the, the chance that we had right at the beginning to tour with bowling was fantastic because yeah. you know that changed everything you know and it was a, an amazing thing to do and there's been highlights like that throughout our career you know? yeah. Yeah. how about you captain any uh, collaborations any interactions through the years that just have a special place in your heart yeah, um, Mark Bowen, absolutely yeah. brilliant, and he was really nice to us. And we caught him at the right time because uh, I think he'd gone through his rock star phase, and he was uh, he was kind of he'd had a bit of a slump in the old career, and he was like doing a comeback. And he was smart enough uh, f- from the old guard um, of uh, kind of rock stars and stuff to um, he looked at punk and he saw something you know that he could work with rather than uh, you know the Phil Collinses and Derek Clapton's who 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 thought that punk rock was like sort of uh, an absolute disgrace yeah. I mean I heard the Phil Collins reference on stage tonight but we <laughs> yeah yeah he didn't like punk rock much but I mean you know you're pretty daft if you if you see a kind of youth uh, kind of movement like that come through and uh, it's just like rock and roll or it's just like you know the the, the Rolling Stones were getting locked up in 67 and then you know, punk rock comes along and then something else to replace it. The end of the world as we know it, you know. I mean, you know, yeah, we we wanted to uh, change, certainly change uh, the, the, the music business, you know. And we certainly wanted to um, make, make the music that we wanted to hear. But, you know, we're just a bunch of nice guys, really. Yeah, you definitely are nice guys. Well, one last question for you guys. You guys chuckle as though I was being sarcastic. No, <laughs> genuinely nice gentleman, for sure. Sadly, today, uh, the world lost uh, the great uh, Purple One, the, the majestic prince. It's terrible. There's all and these great sort of, um, you know, uh, Bowie's gone and, and Prince is gone and Lemmy's gone. It's like, I mean, yeah. it's, it's horrific, really. Yeah. I guess it's inevitable, but you don't see it coming. 
You know? yeah. I certainly didn't see Prince. I mean, Prince isn't an old man, is he? And I he was so. just starting to do some new material, I believe. I believe so. I believe yeah. so. Well, tonight, I mean, I was in the audience tonight and just saw the energy and the reaction when you guys basically, uh, tip of the hat, tip of the beret, an ode to Prince there with a, a cover of um, Anik. I know. <laughs> I, I reckon that you guys did it pretty quickly on the fly, you know, in terms yeah, of yeah. performing the song. But uh, performed on Manic Monday, of course, um, performed by the Bengals, but written by Prince. Yeah. And so uh, the crowd, it was a beautiful thing. Actually, we even saw Morrissey in the audience tonight, who I guess is a big fan. And I looked over, he was about 10 feet away from us. And um, there was a comment, I think, there about the uh, untimely passing of musicians. And unfortunately, the the effing politicians don't uh, die off as quickly or something. And I saw Morrissey, and um, he was really clapping and nodding and really reacting. So I think that you uh, touched uh, many hearts and minds tonight, Captain. Oh, well, you know, I mean, what's, it, was, it was an easy kind of hit, really, wasn't it? Politicians bad, musicians good, and uh, unfortunately the musicians are, are popping off at the moment. But it's just, I, I don't, I honestly don't, if there's any young musicians out there, rock and roll is fucking brilliant, but it's not necessarily good for your health. And so, um, I mean, this is me talking. This is Captain Sensible. I'm daft as a brush, but <laughs> don't go, you know, I mean, just take care. Don't, like, sort of um, obliterate your brain uh, the way uh, I, I tried to do in the old days. Yeah. You guys look pretty healthy. Any uh, final words from you, Dave, about folks out there, musicians, uh, fo following the right path versus the uh, the wrong path? I don't path. know what the right path is, but I'm I'm I would love to see some uh, bands that were going to just outrage everybody and do something really amazing. You know, I'm always waiting for this wave of young kids to just say, ah, we don't want that. We've got something new. Right. Well, I see little things, but you know, eventually, I suppose there's going to be a new movement or something. It has to be. Well, hopefully some people out there tonight watching this or who were in the audience got inspired, and there's a next movement coming very soon. Yeah, they'll be saying, we want to get rid of that old lot. And, yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, that's you know, that's what we said about the Rolling Stones, and they're still going. So while, while they're still playing, you know, I, I feel um, it's my duty to carry on. It's uh, outrageous to be going 40 years later. I mean, how can you do that? It's, it's extremely yeah. impressive, yes. Well, that's one word for it. Okay. <laughs> You're trying to put a negative spin on this, Dave. It's a beautiful, no, no, amazing no, no, thing. No, you know? I don't mean it like that, but it's just, it's, uh, you don't expect it to be, you know. Nice, you, you know. The, the, Rolling Stones, the Rolling Stones were nice enough when we did our first gig in New York to send uh, a, big, uh, cream, a big cream cake and a couple of... Um, L ladies of the night, yes, yes. which was so, very nice of them. Some yeah. groupies, so to speak, and some, okay, got you, yeah, yeah. Although we've never met them, yeah. Stones, but they did that for us. Yeah. Right. So um, I, I, you right have to now, say. But I did like Brian so, Jones the best. Yeah. <laughs> you guys had some interactions with Brian Jones. Wow. No, no. Oh. But I mean, he was to me he was the you know when that that early years of Brian Jones were the best Stones albums. All right, Dave. Well, want to thank you, thank your manager, thank everybody here for arranging this interview, and we wish you all the best on your current you, current Ryan. tour. Good night. All right, thanks good so much. And it's good night from that stain on the sofa that <laughs> was Captain Sensible. Yes, indeed. All right, thanks again.